Good afternoon. My name is Susan Derwin and I am the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. I am very happy to be able to welcome our virtual audience to Humanities Decanted. At the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, we created this series as a platform for UCSB humanities and arts faculty to share their newest scholarly and creative work with the campus and broader community. Today, our featured scholar is Jessica Nakamura, a faculty member in UCSB's theater and dance department. Professor Nakamura's research focuses on theater and performance in the Asia Pacific. She will be, she will be speaking to us about her new book, Transgenerational Remembrance, Performance, and the Asia Pacific War in Contemporary Japan. The book was published by Northwestern University Press in January of this year, and as we will learn, it is a probing analysis of the relationship between theater, memory, and intergenerational dialogue. Professor Nakamura will be in conversation with Professor Catherine Neshi, a scholar of modern French literature and intellectual history, trauma, feminist, and gender studies, and modern visual culture. Professor Neshi has published widely in these fields, and we are most grateful that she has agreed to be Professor Nakamura's interlocutor this afternoon. Professors Nakamura and Neshi will be in conversation for about 30 minutes, and then for 10 minutes, Professor Nakamura will take questions from the audience. At any time during the event, you can use the Q&A feature on your screen to submit your questions. We will do our best to answer as many of them as we can. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our interlocutors. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for that introduction. And thank you to the IHC, and in particular, Aaron Nurstad for organizing this event. And thank you to uh, Catherine Neshi for serving as my interlocutor. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of my book before uh, my discussion with uh, Professor Neshi. Um, so my book, Transgenerational Remembrance, Performance and the Asia Pacific War in Contemporary Japan, explores the role of performance at a time of spectral returns when the reemergence of memories of Japanese atrocities prompt fierce debates over the war's legacy and questions of individual responsibility to the distant past. I focus on transgenerational remembrance, what I define as the movement of memories across generations to explore how younger generations, those born after 1960, who have little to no direct connection to the war, are obligated to it and can relate to it. I locate case studies of performances created by grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the war generation. These performances, by relating audiences to events that are unknown, disputed, and inaccessible, Cultivate, cultivate engaged modes of responsibility relevant regardless of personal histories or knowledge of the war. My study contextualizes performance within historiographical and ethical issues inherent in transgenerational remembrance. In the contemporary period, one key event is the reemergence of survivors of Japanese war atrocities, including Korean forced laborers and comfort women or sex slaves in the Japanese army, um, for the Japanese army. Their testimonies resulted in bringing these topics into the public eye again and challenging the post-war dominant narrative that focused primarily on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In response to the survivor outcry, a growing conservative historical revisionist movement disputed their testimonies, calling for written documents to verify them. The conflict between survivor outcry on the one hand and historical revisionists on the other reveals the impossibilities of knowing the past, including the lack of written records, whether absent uh, during the war or destroyed immediately after, uh, and the fact that those uh, that survivors came forward over 50 years after the war's end, and there are a number of those who could not or were not willing to come forward. Against these historiographical impossibilities, the performances I explore affect alternative approaches to the past, separate from archival, evidentiary, and documentary concerns that have plagued contemporary debates about the historicization and commemoration of the war. Looking at these performances also allows me to address the ethical issues that arise with survivor outcry. Because the Asia Pacific War involved almost everyone in Japan, in contemporary Japan, younger generations were left to negotiate between unknowns of the past, survivor testimonies, and legal actions against the state. 
I turned to philosopher Takahashi Tetsuya's concept of responsibility to define the role and obligation of those seemingly disconnected from the war past. And so Takahashi distinguishes between war responsibility, uh, senso sekinin, from post-war responsibility, sengo sekinin. Uh, he argues that war responsibility is for actual crimes committed during the war that are addressed through legal realms, including the international uh, military tribunal for the Far East, also known as the Tokyo Trials. Uh, for Takahashi, in contrast, post-war responsibility is separate from these legal realms and extends to the general, uh, general Japanese public. Takahashi articulates a new term, responsibility, oto kanose, based on the, art, uh, on the act of call and response, in which a person is obligated to respond to a call from, for example, a survivor of war atrocities. To understand performance as potentially establishing relationships of responsibility between younger generations and the war past, I look to the traditional Japanese no theater as an analytical framework. No feature, I'm interested in no because it features a dialogue. Um, it's in, often a transgenerational dialogue uh, between a ghost and a living person. Uh, and significantly, no privileges this dialogue over plot. So given the contemporary historiographical debates about the Asia Pacific War, my focus on no brackets questions or my use of no brackets questions of contents, including what happened and what can be known. And instead, it helps me explore how performances can create um, engagement in dialogue. Throughout, my book applies different elements of no, from structure to characterization to acting, to understand how these performances create complex encounters between elided yet returning pasts and present individuals. And I'm going to briefly share my screen. So the book is organized by key topics that become contentious in contemporary Japan. Uh, many of these topics um, reemerge after the 1980s. Uh, the first two chapters examine wartime ghosts that remain in contemporary Japan. Chapter one looks at Yasukuni Shinto Shrine uh, and its uh, reiteration of wartime attitudes about spirits of fallen soldiers. During the war, fallen soldiers returned to Japan where they were transformed into gods of the nation at Yasukuni. And while Yasukuni was demoted to a private religious institution in the post-war period, its physical space remains in contemporary Japan, in the middle of Tokyo, uh, where it is a site of controversy when politicians visit it, including the recent, uh, the former prime minister, Abe Shinzo. So instead of thinking about the, instead of examining these controversies, I'm interested in reading the space of Yasukuni to argue that the shrine choreographs visitors' bodies to repeat these past attitudes, aligning them with fallen soldiers in a rehearsal for their ultimate return as spirits of fallen soldiers in future wars. The second chapter explores the figure of the kamikaze or tokotai, uh, an image that reiterates Yasukuni's militaristic rhetoric in popular culture, especially in recent films. Uh, and in contrast to these recent films, I identify artists uh, Imi Yuki and Koizumi Meido, uh, who defamiliarize the popular image of the kamikaze through, represent, uh, through repetition. In these two chapters, I examine how elements of performance, including spectacle and embodiment, support images that remain from the war. I also explore the limits of representation in memories of the Asia Pacific War, looking at the ways in which the image of the fallen soldier is so powerful and so prevalent that it may not be able to be avoided or countered. After the first two chapters, I turn to topics underrepresented during the post-war period that have reemerged in contemporary Japan. Chapters three and four explore the ways in which performances create relationships of responsibility for their audiences. Chapter three, ex Tirato Oriza's Soul Shinin, or uh, Citizens of Soul, a four-play series focused on the daily life of a Japanese colonial settler family living in Seoul during Japan's occupation of the Korean Peninsula. I consider how the series directs audience attention to what is not portrayed on stage to prompt inquiry into Japan's colonial involvement and its historical representation. Chapter four examines representations of the Japanese comfort women, and I examine Shimada Yoshiko's durational performance, Becoming a Statue of a Japanese Comfort Woman, to explore how embodiment and performance develops responsibility to those absent. And chapters five and six complicate notions of how performance encourage or prompt audience responsibility to past events. 
These chapters look at performances that challenge the very possibility of transmission of war memories. In chapter five, I consider potential issues with the circulation of testimonies of the Battle of Okinawa, the final major battle of the war. And I look at Yamashiro Chikako's video and photography work uh, that severs her viewer from testimonies content, reasserting the inaccessible qualities of inherited testimonies. And finally, in chapter six, I consider how re responsibility uh, may result in conflict with uh, performances of Japanese American incarceration. In contrast to other topics discussed in my book, inc the incarceration of Japanese Americans has resulted in US legislative action. Um, and I explore the work by Japanese nationals, Yanagi Miwa and Kondo Aisuke, that disrupt any appearance of a resolution of the event. So I think this is a good place to end and transition to the dialogue with Professor Neshi. I'm going to stop my share. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, and I'm really delighted as a memory studies scholar, but knowing more the Western uh, context to have a dialogue with you. This is a true honor. And thank you for, to the IFC for the opportunity for this dialogue. So my first question uh, to you, uh, Jessica, pertains to uh, one of the uses of the um, ancestral no theater, uh, and you use it to consider uh, alternative models of interaction between the living and the dead. And so in your analysis, especially in chapter two, as we have just seen, you show that artists, uh, one is a playwright, the other one is a video artist, undermine the consumption of the kamikaze figure in Japanese popular culture. So can you tell us a little bit more about this defamiliarization process that the artists enact and how do they call the audience to the response ability you are calling for? Well, thank you so much for that question. Um, yeah, so I think the, you know, in terms of thinking about how these artists, Imai Masayuki and Koizumi Mero, uh, engage in a defamiliarization process that call audience to responsibility, I'm, I'm interested in looking at repetition in the, both of their works. And I'll talk about um, Imai in particular, um, but, the, but I'm very interested in putting this kind of repetition in their works in contrast with how the, com the image of the kamikaze circulates effectively in popular culture. And I use, as you noted, I, I'm interested in Japanese no, um, really as a kind of, as a model for thinking about how repetition works in these uh, performances. And in this in chapter, I look at how no kind of repeats, but with how we in, in no, we find repetition, but with a difference in which we see the repetition in on a number of different levels, including when no was first developing, we see the kind of repetition of plays, but the then the conscious work to shift the kind of the plays depending on the audience. Um, but we also see it on the level of the play themselves, um, especially the plays that feature uh, ghosts that return in which a ghost, you know, comes in disguised in the first act and then reveals uh, their identity and then in the second act appears in true form. And so we have repetition with a difference, but repetition with a difference that's effective. effective. Um, and so I'm interested, uh, so for example, in Imai's work, uh, I look at uh, this play that he's written called Winds of God, which is the English kind of translation of Kamikaze. Um, and the play is about essentially two contemporary comedians that in some in a traffic accident they are sent back in time to their past yeah. selves in, in a uh, kamikaze training camp at the end of world war ii uh, and the content of the play is interesting but what i'm actually more interested in is the fact that imai as both a playwright and an actor who plays the main role in this play is uh, constantly reproduces this play from 1989 until 2015. And so thinking about this idea of repetition with a difference and what it does, it does with his work. And 
I'll just also say that it's in mul we have multiple versions of this as well, where we have multiple productions. Um, and then we have an English language uh, film, a Japanese language film, a Japanese uh, TV drama. And I also believe we have a novel of this. So multiple so productions. Multiple forms of remediation that are linked exactly. to modern technology as well, mm. which are a technology of haunting and spectral returns as well, right? So you're being helped by media as well. Exactly. That's uh, so fantastic in thinking about these kind of sh shifting back and forth. And, um, and also in the play reviews, uh, we see like there's some play reviews that reference older productions. So I don't want to call it a long running production in the theatrical production. Mm -hmm. We have these multiple, as you're saying, remediations of it as well. So thinking about these repeated versions of Winds of God as enacting a process of remembrance mm -hmm. uh, and creating, you know, models of responsibility in a couple of ways. And I'll just kind of talk about two. The first is that Imai becomes himself a model who is going, you know, in constantly reappearing in these productions of someone who's going back to the past and inquiring into it. Um, and then secondly, because it's known that these are repeated productions, that, that the work is the, all of these productions and, and versions together are destabilizing this image of the kamikaze that we see in in films um, where we might, as, as I talk about in the chapter, we might see more of a passive acceptance of younger generations of a particular image um, in films like um, A.N. No Zero, like the eternal zero. Um, mm -hmm. So in contrast, we see this kind of this work of repetition of um, destabilizing it and almost to make it strange if we think about like Bertolt Brecht. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Good. So I'm, I'm following up with that on the second question. Uh, you can use other examples that uh, the, the different examples you take from visual media and embodied performances, you insist on the fact that younger Japanese, Korean, Japanese American generations should question the past again and again. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering in mm -hmm. what ways are theatrical and visual performances able to foster critical acts of remembrance and do so more than, for example, historical inquiry or fiction, for mm -hmm. example. Well, thank you so much. I mean, and, and well, I guess something that's unique about the performances that I'm looking at um, is the way in which they're mobilizing and engaging with their audiences, I think that's really key. Um, and to me, that's something unique about these particular performances. Um, and th that's how I would argue that they, that one of the things that allows them to foster what you're uh, describing as critical acts of remembrance um, and that I think are particular to the mechanisms of performance. So thinking yeah. again about um, you know, all of them are very, many of them, I think, yeah, all of them, I would say, are um, attentive to audiences and the experience of watching and what that means, what that, and, and levels of res not only responsibility, but complicity um, and really in this idea of an active watching. So uh, I'll give another example from chapter two because I think it's such a, he's a, such a fantastic artist, uh, Koizumi Meido, um, and uh, he is very much interested in creating these installations. So they're video pieces, but he uses the space, the gallery spaces to create these essentially audience experiences where you, he plays with kind of projections on different sides or, um, and, so, and he's very interested in essentially in, in the pieces that I talk about, in one of them, uh, Portrait of a Young Samurai, uh, he essentially is repeating a scene over and over, or he, and he's, acting, he's asking an actor to repeat a scene over and over again, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he interrupts, and, and, so, and then it, it, the emotion of that scene becomes more and more heightened um, mm -hmm. at the, until the very end. Um, and so thinking about the way in which Koizumi is both you know, exposing the mechanisms, but then he also, that piece in particular, he creates, when I saw it uh, in Tokyo, he creates almost like a movie theater experience in the gallery space to really kind of activate the audience and think about our, you know, the audience experience mm -hmm. and how yeah. the audience is playing a role in this particular image uh, as well. So 
throughout, I'm, I'm really interested in the ways in which these uh, performances are calling out to their audiences and uh, involving their audiences. And I think when we put that, uh, it, I think it's very critical when thinking about how these works really foreground what is Un, what cannot be known, what may be inaccessible, and to bring the audience into that relationship, I think is really, really something that is unique to these works. Uh, just, just as an aside, but mm -hmm. so, but the the type of performance that you are talking about does not um, foster empathy or identification, mm -hmm. right? It's bearing that kind of process because you know the the audience who is looking at cannot really say that this is their experience right because that would be displacing what is being uh, thought about you know the, the kind of past that is in the past right so you become responsible but at, at the same time you are being called for to to react or to um to take into account the past but not identify with it right Absolutely, especially in Koizumi's works um, and thinking mm -hmm. about the portrait of a young samurai. I mean, the scene that he's, ask, he's asking the actor to reperform over and over again is a highly emotional kind of monologue that the actor is giving. He's, the actor is playing a kamikaze character who's telling his parents he's going to go off to a training camp and essentially sacrifice his life for the nation. And Koizumi is also actively referencing uh, the film, the, uh, it, the Japanese title, is escaping me right now, but it's uh, for those we love, I think, which, it, but the literal title, the literal translation is, it is for you that I will die. It's, it's about a kamikaze Sacrifice, training camp. Yeah. 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 Um, and so this kind of, it, it, there's no kind of, you know, it's about exposing the mechanisms of any kind of like affective engagement, I think, mm -hmm. in this kind of repetition and interrupting and then pushing the way in which we hear uh, Koizumi push this actor to go further. He keeps saying, you know, you have more samurai spirits, you have to, br you know, bring it up through your, like, guts and you know, pour it out, like, things, things like that. So, yeah, so the, definitely the empathy is not, I think, part of what's, what's happening here. Uh, thank you. So, Good, so let's, let's move from yes. our <laughs> hero <laughs> to, to women who are yeah the non-hero, the anti-hero who are elided. So let's look at your chapter four mm -hmm. in which you, you focus on the body, but also gender and the nation and the body as a dialogical or dialogic medium mm -hmm. for conjuring missing figures. Mm -hmm. And you come to the case of comfort women. So those women survivors, they do not call out to younger generations. Uh, some of them, you know, the Korean one, you know, some of the Korean one do, but you look at the Japanese one and you say that they are missing as much as they have been elided from dominant historical narratives. So can you tell us a little more about Shimada's um, recent becoming a statue of a Japanese comfort woman. Mm -hmm. You argue for another positive relationship of younger generation, mm -hmm. younger generations to the unclear, um, the absent, the unavailable. Mm -hmm. But can you comment on what you mean by this kind of relationality? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I think it's, I'm, and I think it is key to, to note, uh, as you do, that you know, Sh Shimada is representing a Japanese comfort woman who have not, for the most part, come forward. And they're a very controversial figure in, in some respects in, um, in contemporary Japan. Um, but it, you know, this idea of, I'm, I'm interested in the way in which Shimada's, in Shimada's durational performance, that her body is, and her kind of appearance as this Japanese comfort woman is it actually references multiple and I would say ambiguous and not entirely legible figures. Uh, and so be, because she's, you know, she, she's middle aged, um, she's wearing this kimono, she's sitting outside the Japanese embassy in London. And so I'm interested in how she can be read in a number of different ways. And she actually creates a video piece later on in which it, it becomes clear that passersby are kind of in part ignoring her, in part, yeah. Think, yeah. yeah, or taking, you know, photos of her. Photos just of selfies. Yes, it's, it's a very, and which is it's also very, you know, much a commentary on how, you know, 
how much we know about this figure. Um, and, and so this, but I think that this is a really interesting thing that the piece is doing because I think of the ways in which she becomes this very ambiguous figure um, that can also be complicit, that can also be a figure that's participating in the war efforts. Um, and I, I make this reading also based on her other work in which she's really ch questioning the role of women and their participation in the war on a number of different levels. Um, and so she's, in, she's unclear what her body is, is and represents. And so I think that this offers an opportunity for the pass, passersby and viewers to engage in different relationships with her to kind of work through different relationships to try out different relationships um, and for me this is really interesting because i think of i talk about um, the feminist theorist ueno chizuko in that chapter who discusses this idea of uh, positionality that it's important to that to relate to the comfort women that and she says we should I think about who we are that's relating and I think that this is something that Shimada's piece is doing is really challenging the person and calling to question the person that is responding yeah and there's um you know I, I, I always still I'm still wondering but maybe we can talk about it another time or someone will ask the question of its relation to the Korean one, the Korean in Korea in Seoul that was erected in 2010 yes. or 11, I forgot. Yes. So thanks so much, Jessica. This is my last question. Um, and in your last two examples, you recognize these are more pessimistic. Mm -hmm. They focus on loss uh, due to temporal distance and dislocation and the impossible transfer back from the past into the present. For example, uh, in the artistic uh, works you examine, you emphasize the inaccessibility of the testimony of Okinawans, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, those uh, people of Okinawa, who, of Okinawa Prefecture, who had to sacrifice themselves and were asked to commit suicide, you know, during that last battle. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were thus victims of, of Japanese nationalism. And you suggest also the difficulty of listening to video testimonies. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest is the ethical attitude in this case for those who still want to listen and share uh, this experience, share in, you know, and, mm -hmm. and understand, be part of that experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That, that's such a, thank you so much. Um, and I think that Yamashiro Chikako's work that I talk about in the chapter about Battle of, the Battle of Okinawa, I think she offers kind of a, an example of how some kind of ethical engagement can happen when we, we might have kind of a disruption or inaccessibility of testimonies. And I think the Battle of Okinawa in general is a really interesting or, you know, an important case to think about because, you know, we, we have these group suicides that, you know, are, you know, that were coerced by the Japanese military. Um, and we also have this kind of, um, we have a lot of work being done in the 1980s to document video testimonies. And so we have this you know, proliferation of like this huge document of, yeah. or this huge archive of these video testimonies. Um, and what Yamashiro is doing in her work, um, in her inheritance series, um, is that she is really disrupting the ability to transfer these testimonies. Um, the premise of this series is that she goes to like an elderly daycare center and she yeah. essentially hears, she asks the, the people who are there to tell them, to tell her about uh, their experiences at the Battle of Okinawa. And the pieces that she creates, she never actually gives, she never actually recreates a testimony from the Battle of Okinawa. She does from elsewhere, but not from the Battle of Okinawa itself. Um, and she often shows herself listening to these testimonies and how difficult it is. Um, so she's kind of doing a number of, I think she's showing a number of different ethical attitudes in this, but the, you know, the first is that she separates the listener of testimony from the viewer of her piece. Um, and I think that's a really key move is yeah. making this distinction. Um, but then she also, as a listener of testimony, she shows 
like again and again how emotionally difficult it is, how impossible it is at times to listen. Um, and then she also shows uh, in um, Sinking Voices uh, Red Sea, uh, she shows uh, the inability to even access these testimonies because they're so connected because she connects them so much with Okinawa. So this kind of this we I think from her there's this a, a, another ethical attitude of trying to listen, trying to find, tr trying to do this work, and perhaps with not being able to. Um, but we we see on the picture you you show when you presented your chapter mm -hmm. the the tear right mm -hmm. uh, the somber mood and the tear in her mm -hmm. eyes right yeah and at some point I mean the, in that video she's now she's you could hear the voice of a man describing a moment during the from the Battle of Saipan in which he watches his family commit suicide yes, yeah. um, and she um, she essentially is. Um, She's mouthing his words, and at that point, when he talks about the actual act, she stops, and it's just so emotional for her. So we see that even this, the inability to go on. But and I think we should. It seems we like we should to, probably to yes. Time for questions. Thank you so yes. much, Jessica. Oh, thank you so much. Hello, that was just wonderful. I come bearing questions. <laughs> The first is, uh, what occurred in the No Theater during the war? Was there anything performed in that moment that suggested how that moment, the war moment, should be remembered, or perhaps what should not be remembered? That's a great question, and that's something that, what happened to the No Theater during the war? I'm actually not interested in the no theater itself, I'm using it as an analytical lens. So I don't have that information ready to hand. I know that theaters closed down and for a while they were, you know, theaters were helping in the national, um, in the war effort as well, staging these militaristic plays that no theater during um, Japan's modernization was considered kind of a, like the traditional Japanese theater. Um, but I also want to distinguish from kind of no, no as a historical form, no as a living tradition, and the ways in which I'm trying to use it as an analytical framework to understand the ways in which the past is returning, to look for a different kind of a, a way to think about the way uh, past returning and having a dialogue with the present. But thank you so much for that question. Continuing about yeah. no. <laughs> oh, no. If we, <laughs> yes, no. If we <laughs> depart from the understanding that no is mostly seen by the middle aged and older generations, mm -hmm. how does the project of creating new models of remembrance within no reach beyond this particular theater form? Oh. That's a really good question because there actually is new no that's happening. And this is something I didn't talk about in my book, but I did a little bit of research into because um, there is a, um, a playwright, his name is Tata Tomio, and he was very interested in, I want to say the 1990s, in creating these new no plays in which we're using the form, in which he uses the form of no, but he portrays like a, a atrocity, like, events from the war. And so we see him using this format in, in which we have, um, in particular, there's one I think that's really striking where he uses the um, the Battle of Okinawa and he has a, I think he has someone, he has a man go to, uh, essentially, it's a, it's a son and he meets his mother, his mother returns as a ghost and she kind of just discloses her experiences during the Battle of Okinawa. So we see someone like Tata Tomio really engage with the form to think about mm -hmm. this, this cre again, creating this dialogue and, and really kind of portraying this particular event. Um, and I also say that there's other, there are other companies that are interested in using this form um, that tour outside Japan. And I would, I would like to think that they don't have just middle, middle age audience members. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'm very interested in your uh, uh, premise or point of departure that um, these performances in general correspond to a call and response uh, structure 
or logic really. So my question is um, sort of twofold. If not to sort of empathic, uh, if critical identification, then to what are these performances calling? Mm. What are they soliciting in the audience, in the viewer, um, in the seer, in the listener? And um, how do you know when that call is met? That is a fantastic question. Um, and one that I'm not sure, well, what are the performances calling? I think in the respondent or the yeah I think that something I'm interested in what the performances are calling is not a particular thing but in it, it really is to I think something that kept coming up again and again when I was working on my book is that is this question of essentially this unknowability of the past or that, that these memories are inaccessible. I mean, they're just, you know, that we have, you know, we know that, you know, either like for the comfort women, for example, we know that, you know, there weren't records kept. Um, we also know that between like in the period between the uh, announcement of uh, surrender and US occupation, there was just like the mass burning of documents. And so we have this, as I discussed, you know, this historiographical, issue, but it really is about this kind of around the stalemate of, of, you know, historical revisionists call for written documents, but they just, you know, some of them just don't exist. And we have then survivors saying, well, we have written, you know, we have spoken testimony. And so this kind of this in binary that's created between the written and the oral that then ignores the failures or, or the limitations of these. And so I think in, instead of to what the performances are calling, for in terms of a response, to me, it's a way for the performances, I think, are encouraging audience, like encouraging audiences or prompting audiences to engage with these unknown, these absences, these kind of what's not kind of present. Um, I, so I guess that would be my answer to that. Yeah, right. Thank you so Thank you. much. Yeah. How does Kondo Aisuke cast his audience? If his work engages with Japanese American internment camps, is it intended for Japanese diasporic audiences or Japanese audiences? I.e., is it trans-Pacific as well as transgenerational? And how is that intention revealed in his work? Thank you so much. That is such a great question because Kondo Aisuke is a really interesting figure because he's Japanese, but uh, a Japanese national, but he works in, at times he's in the US um, and he is tracing often his great grandfather, yes, his great grandfather's experiences in the US from immigration to um, internment to incarceration. And then his grand great grandfather returned to Japan. But Kondo also lives in Berlin. And so he's kind of tri triangulating between these different uh, spaces. Um, and um, so I guess I talk about his work as a trans-Pacific kind of engagement in which he's looking at him as a Japanese national coming to the U.S. and doing this you know, site-specific work. Um, and the ways in which we kind of thinking through these ideas of kind of possession and um, like the ways in which he's essentially disrupting the kind of apparent resolution of kind of the legislation around internment and or incarceration. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think I'll end there. I think it's, it's a meaty question, but you know, a comment to... just yes. for further reflection, but not response is uh, an audience member wondering if the call and response is a request to be seen. And now here's my question. Yeah, the next I think question. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Would it be possible to say that some of these performances are less about healing the past than about exploring the potential to imagine agencies that were denied in the past or occluded by other forms of memory? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would absolutely say that is the, the case that it, um, that I, I don't think that healing is something that these, I would describe these performances as doing at all, but about this is, I think this idea of you know, particular agency, mm -hmm. um, I think is, I think really like, fantastic. Um, so thank you so much.
All right, next one. Uh, would you call a lot of your subjects work an expression of intergenerational trauma? So much of the trauma is about both the silencing and an inability to be truly silent and hidden, I suppose, mm -hmm. which feels prominent to me. Ma our our uh, questioner. Many younger Okinawans have spoken to me in my own field work about the effects of intergenerational trauma on their own outlook of the world. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. I think that it depends on the topic, but I, and in particular Okinawa, I think that that is definitely going on. Um, and that, you know, we can think about, you know, Yamashiro Chikako's work. I mean, she very much positions herself as someone from Okinawa for a long time when she was receiving a number of, uh, inter a lot of international acclaim. She's remained in Okinawa doing work and, you know, and living there because that was really important to her. And I think this engagement in which she is, in the ways in which she's engaging with hearing the stories of the elderly and of essentially processing her own, I mean, she doesn't talk about this, but I mean, there's clearly kind of a back and forth that's happening there. Um, and um, I do, I am clear though, um, and I think that that definitely could be further, you know, that's something that is, I think, of interest to me, especially thinking about these particular spaces in Okinawa, these, uh, we could call them, you know, traumatic sites. Um, I think about when I was there and I went to a cave where there was a forced suicide. Um, one of the people I was with refused to go with me into the cave because she said that her own family experience, she felt she wasn't comfortable doing that. Um, but I also try to, in thinking about this idea of inaccessible memories of or making and making inaccessible i also want to i try in the book to distinguish between ideas of inaccessible unknowable these historiographical questions that i'm grappling with and um, the incomprehensibility of trauma that we often see and so i can i focus more on that on that the idea of the inaccessible the unknowable instead of these questions of the incomprehensible. I don't think they're obviously there. And that I think that especially with Okinawa, but it's not something that I focus on as, as much because I'm, I'm so interested in this other side of remembrance. I thank you. And Jessica and Kathy, thank you so much. We have come to the end of our event. Uh, I want to uh, tell you in closing, uh, that first of all, this video will be available uh, within a week on the IHC website. So I encourage you to sign up for our IHC mailing list to access this video and our other information. Um, I would ask our audience to please take a minute to um, fill out the survey that will pop up as you exit. Uh, I am delighted that this was so interesting and uh, contained. We've ended on time, and I want to wish everybody a wonderful evening and say that I hope we see you back at the IHC again soon. So good night to everybody. Bye-bye.